Hello to all of you. We're getting ready to get started. I would like to thank you for joining us today for our webinar, 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten, Early Literacy, Do It Yourself. I'm Liz Bowie, Product Development Manager of Education Markets at DEMCO, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping details, and then I'll introduce our speaker and she can start today's presentation. You should see a chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you have a question or are having any type of technical issue, please feel free to type something there and we'll do our best to get back to you as quickly as we can. We will be taking questions at the end of the session, so if something comes up that you would like clarification on or want to respond to, you can type it into the chat box. We'll be compiling all of your thoughts and questions and can address them at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your question during the session, we will be sure to get answers and post them with the recorded webcast after the event. There's also specific contact information available for Marge and myself that you should see on your screen as well. After the session, you can feel free to email us directly if you have specific questions that we may be able to help with. We're also using Twitter today, and the hashtag is hashtag DemcoIdeas or hashtag 1000BooksB4K. You should be able to see these hashtags on the side of your screen in the chat box. We are monitoring that feed as well for questions and comments. Now, just for fun, while I'm doing introductions, we're going to pop up a poll question on your screen to help us better understand today's audience. And our question is, are you currently running a 1,000 books before kindergarten program? Please take a moment to look at the options and let us know. Now on to introductions. As I mentioned, I'm Liz Bowie, Product Development Manager of Education Markets at DEMCO, and I'm moderating today's session. At DEMCO, we're always interested in ways to better serve the needs of our customers, and these webinars have been a great way for us to connect and provide additional information around important topics for evolving libraries. We are all aware that reading to a child is one of, the mo one of the most powerful ways to boost their brain power, but how do we get families and children engaged in reading outside the library? I'm pleased to introduce you to, introduce you to our speaker, Marge Lockwaters. Marge has more than 40 years of experience in children's services and is an adjunct lecturer at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Library and Information Studies. In her role as consultant, she has presented numerous workshops, webinars, and training on all aspects of youth services, both statewide and nationally. In 2010, she was honored as the Wisconsin Library Association Demco Librarian of the Year. Before I turn this over to Marge, I just want to show our poll results. It looks like most of you haven't started a Thousand Books program yet, but you would like to. Our hope is that by the end of this session, you will have a new understanding of what you can do to enhance or begin your Thousand Books Before Kindergarten program. Marge, we're going to put the controls into your capable hands and you can get started whenever you're ready. Thanks very much, Liz, and hi to everybody out there who's here for our webinar today. I'm really excited to spend time with you all to explore this really great initiative that lets you extend your service to preschoolers beyond active programs like Storytime. Today we're going to look at a little bit of the history of Thousand Books Before Kindergarten. I'm going to share some of my experiences with the program. And also we're going to get into the guts of how you would set up an initiative like this. And finally we'll end up with some key resources that can really help you launch your program. So let's us get launched and started. What is this thousand books before kindergarten? And at its very simplest, what, what this is, is asking parents to read at least a thousand books to a child before they start school or as they are about to start their schooling. So it's a very excellent example and way to do an early literacy initiative. It's an initiative that can increase your library usage both your in-person visits to your library and your circulation. It's very much a do-it-yourself program that families can do at their pace, at their home, so it's not necessarily something that has to happen within your library or school or daycare. It's very open-ended, so families can do that self-pacing. There isn't a lot of deadlines necessarily involved in it. And it's a, what I like to call a stealth or passive program. 
So it's very much like a summer reading program that allows a library to serve kids beyond active programs like story times or an after school club or something that you're doing on your um, weekends or evenings with, with parents that you're presenting or children. So let's talk a little bit about passive programs or stealth programs. Um, and I like to do this because, again, sometimes we think active programs where we're hosting that program or bringing in a performer are the only kinds of programs we can do. But actually, a stealth or a passive program is something that we can add into the offerings that we are giving to our parents. And these are programs that you do some initial planning and setup but they're very easily administered once you set them up with very little ongoing staff time or effort. Families provide the power and the activity on their own time. And, and again, this is why I like to compare these to summer reading programs. There's a lot of, not the events that you're scheduling in summer, but if you're doing a reading incentive program with kids, a reading encouragement program, um, Thousand book programs are very similar to this. So, you know, you send kids in the summer home with materials and they read or do adventures or do writing or whatever, however you set things up. But they're doing this on their own time. And passive programs also encourage return visits to the library without you scheduling an active program. And because you're encouraging these return visits, it often also encourages increased checkouts. Now, I did not create or invent this thousand books concept. Like all good librarians, like you guys, I learned about it from another librarian and I introduced it to our community. So let's take a little teeny tiny peek here. Who are the mothers of this movement? The true mother is Sandy Cross. Uh, a children's librarian at the Bremen Public Library in Indiana. And she read in Mem Fox's Reading Magic a little passage that talked about, wouldn't it be wonderful if all parents would read at least a thousand books to their children before they began school? And Sandy was absolutely inspired, and she created the very first thousand books before kindergarten. And that was... Uh, mm, 2006, 2007, right in that area. And she she put a little post about it on a listserv called PubYak that some of you may be familiar with. And that is where we discovered it. Now, this is kind of, it. that's really the birth of this movement. And, and what Bremen did when they created it, Sandy thought about it and she gave everyone a small three ring uh, binder kind of journal and she had little half pages and enough pages to get to record a hundred books and after every hundred books she would encourage parents to come back into the library and get a small reward um, and then get another sheet so she would give out stickers she gave out a music CD at each 100 level and then at the end she gave a book out to every family and there were some other small incentives along the way, but it was really, it kind of built in accountability and kind of gave that power to the parents. And that was really inspiring to us. It seemed like this could be something we could do at our library. And at that time, um, there weren't, this is an actual uh, Google map um, that locates some of the thousand book programs in our nation. And there's a librarian who runs this, Kathleen Larson. And if you have a program or you start a program, you can, uh, and you'll find the, this link in, in the resources at the end, um, you can actually get in touch with her and say, we have a program going, and she'll put a dot on the Google map. And it does kind of look, there is a kind of a Midwestern concentration right now. Uh, because Kathleen is from Wisconsin and we had some grants to help us start some of these programs in the state. But you can see that this is something that's kind of starting all over. And if you do have a program and you don't see yourself on this map, ooh, ooh, let Kathleen know. So let me tell you a little bit about my Thousand Books experience. Um, 
both of my experiences happened in Wisconsin. The first at Menasha, a small library on the eastern side of the state, very near Green Bay. Um, and we decided to hop on and try this. This was just one of my colleagues at the library said, we, we have to do this. This is such a great idea. And we themed it on the Very Hungry Caterpillar. And one of the things you're going to see throughout this webinar is just how flexible this program is. You set it up in a way that works best for your library, your community, your staffing, your budget, and your needs. That's what's so great about this. So in our theme, we asked parents to come in after every 100 books completed. And, and it was pretty, we had three ring binders as well. We, um, we found a very inexpensive source of CDs, which I will tell you right now no longer exists. <laughs> But um, it was just a really exciting initiative. Kids got a little sticker after each 100 level, way to go, like a little star that they could put on, uh, on themselves or on their sheet or on their uh, reading journal. They also received a, another uh, little dot with a food. So just like a hungry caterpillar ate different things, lollipops and sausages, we had little food stickers at each level and they could stick it on a little, um, actually on a wall mural and each one of the caterpillar segments, we had 10 segments and they would fill up the 100 segment, which would be full of lollipops, and then the 200 segment. When they finished 200, they'd stick a, a pie sticker on that segment. So it was kind of a big visual for everybody to look at. And it was instantly popular. Um, we asked parents to return after every 100 level to get new sheets, and so we were guaranteeing, besides that registration you know, stop, we were guaranteeing 10 more visits to the library. And because we were saying, hey, you want to read a thousand books, parents really wanted to check out a lot of materials. So that resulting circulation burst was explosive. And it remained high for, it usually remains high for about the first two years that you're doing a program like this. It levels off after that, in my experience, and that, but it never goes down um, below what you started with. So it's, it keeps your circulation, you know, in a kind of a nice, um, nice place. Now, when I came to La Crosse, on the right-hand side of your screen, um, when I came to La Crosse, Wisconsin, and that's a, a community, a larger library, we had, um, there's a main branch and two smaller branches of the library, so we were a multi-branch location. We wanted to do 1,000 books again, and so we pulled together a focus group of parents and caregivers and just talked about what they'd like to see because we, you know, I had experience with it and I wanted to see what kind of things would, when we explained the program to our, this focus group, what kind of things would they like. And that was really interesting because in Menasha we had started the program birth through five years old. And when we talked to our focus group in La Crosse, they said, well, you know, children birth to one really won't have a sense of excitement about this program because they're so young, they don't know what's going on, so let's start it at age one. And asking parents to do all this reading is really a, kind of burdensome, so how about you give incentives not just to kids, like stickers or a music CD or a nursery rhyme CD, why don't you give incentives to the parents as well? So I'll get back to both of those decisions a little bit later in our, in a, when we look more closely at, at these programs. So for us as a larger community, we had to make sure that Thousand Books was sustainable for us financially. So giving out a three-ring binder was a high cost for us because we knew we would easily get a thousand children involved in this program in our community. So then we decided, okay, let's just do folders to make it more affordable. So we, we had a gardening theme with a little rainbow and we used some copyright free clip art to create our logo. And you can see these are two very distinct programs in terms of theme. 
So with our Thousand Books theme at La Crosse, we um, had a sheet that was double-sided and parents could fill out a hundred titles of books that they had read to their kids. And this was very similar to both Bremen and what we did in Menasha. Um, and what we found is that we would encourage, we got a lot of initial sign up for the program and people would come back and then they, it started to fall off a little and we would encourage people to sign up and they would get back to us and say, you know, we are so busy, I mean, we're just running all the time, you know, I'm working part time or I'm working full time and, and I want to do this program, but writing all these books is just a burden. So we're just, we just don't need that in our lives, but we're reading these books. So we really listened to that, and so take one is the first sheet that we did, and after listening to the parents, we went to take two. And these, this is the new seed bookmark that we came up with, which has 100 seeds on it, and we said to parents, okay, we, we hear you talking. Why don't you just fill in these seeds as you read the books to the kids? and that will work out just great. And again, we encourage them to come back. But we also, as a staff, found that we missed seeing some of those books that were written down because these level sheets, these hundred level sheets, were almost like a little history of those kids and the things that they liked to read. Because one of the things we talked about with our parents was that you don't have to make it hard. If you read a book multiple times, you know how kids have those favorite books and they want to hear it over and over? Each time that you read that book, that is a distinct time. You know, you can just put little, you know, the same, the same, the same marks down on your sheet. You don't have to go, well, I, I read that 50 times, you know, meh, that's only one, one reading, one book. Each time the kids were read the book, even if it was repeated, that counted because repetition and pattern is so important for preschoolers. We also would say, hey, you know you're going to read the books that you're checking out right now. Feel free to just, you know, staple on that um, receipt, your book receipt that tells you when your books are due to say which ones that you that you did. But, you know, this little take two really kind of did work. But we still did miss seeing what those titles were. So then we came up with what has been our, our kind of our iteration for the last three years. And that is a level sheet that on one side has 100 little seeds. And then it's got room to write down 10 favorite books. We also made it into a half sheet. A, it saved money. And B, it was more handleable for the parents. It was a little bit less paper. And then on the other side, we said, look, there's an opportunity to do something on the other side. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you see early literacy tips that we put on each level sheet. This is a kind of piece of your thousand books that again hits on flexibility. You can do whatever works and change as you go along. And I really like to make that point because sometimes we get very involved with like, oh, we can't make a change. This is what we decided. We were so good at our decisions. Really, you can keep on evolving your program as you go along. In both of our programs, we had incentives at both libraries. Um, you can see the little 200, you go. We give those little star stickers out. And they were also be, um, we love stickers. And we found out that preschoolers love stickers too. So in our program in lacrosse, you see the little girl standing by her, uh, a kind of a garden of flowers. That was one of our early finishers. And we would give kids colored stickers and just have white flowers. And the more kids um, finished a level, the more the flowers would fill up with color. And you know, I mentioned to you that our focus group said, hey, you should have parent prizes, but we found that actually, you know, they, we had lanyards and, you know, a little refrigerator magnet that you could put your date due notices and, you know, your receipt printout in. Parents didn't care. They, the joy that kids had in getting a sticker was everything. And so we really kind of pulled back on how many 
things we give out for the program. We actually give out a book bag at the beginning now with our library uh, logo on it because then parents might use that bag everywhere in town so they're advertising thousand books before kindergarten and then a book at the end and that book has been really a special special piece of what we give but again these incentives can be whatever one wants to do so what were our outcomes first of all at both of the libraries we could make our programs completely adaptable to each different community and to our budgets it did create that substantial circulation increase during the first two years. It really allowed us to create value for families with very little ongoing time or effort because parents check in very, very quickly. It lets parents take the lead and we are the cheerleaders so we get to give away stickers and congratulate the kids and say to the parents, great job. And it also really supports and extends our early literacy mission beyond story time. So we, most of our libraries are doing some kind of story time. But this kind of extends that so that we're saying we're, again, putting the power into the hands of our families. So let's spend some time now looking at some of the issues in setting up a program because that's a really big uh, part of as you think about this initiative and what you might want to do, how do you get to your end goal? So we're really going to kind of dive in here and look on, at things to think about as you're setting up a program. The first thing before you start any, any, anything is you want to think about what do you or what does your library want to accomplish? What are those goals that, that you hope to do? So if your goal is you're thinking about you want to make it a really fun method for preschoolers and families to share together. Okay, if that's your project goal, then one of the things you want to do as you set up your program is to keep rules at a minimum. So don't sweat the small stuff. You know, if somebody isn't quite done with their thousand books before kindergarten and they started kindergarten, it's okay. Let them finish while they're in kindergarten because your goal is to do something fun and to really kind of place the library in that um, place of saying, hey, we, we love seeing you guys accomplish a lot with having these books read, thousand books. Maybe your project goal, and you can do all or none, or it's, it's very individual, these are just samples. Maybe you want to introduce children to a wide range of excellent books. Well then, you may want to have special book lists available, or authors that you recommend to the parents at different ages for the kids. Or perhaps you want to have some special uh, maybe a, a part of a bookshelf or a shelf or two that are just uh, dedicated to face out displays of fun picture books and board books that parents can read aloud that you're going to have to really keep full. They're going to be just swept off the shelves. So that would be a way for you to put lots and lots of books out there. Or maybe your goal is you want to promote pre-literacy so that kids are ready to enter school a little bit more ready, more ready to learn, well then maybe include some of those early literacy tips that we know so much about and we love to share with our families. That's a great way to help families become more aware of things they can do at home to help their kids. Um, encourage regular library use by families. Maybe you want to see people come in as many times as you can returning sheets. Well, in that case, you know, just give out one sheet at a time, one 100 level at a time. Or maybe you want to say, oh, let's say return after every 250 books. You know, we don't have to have 10 visits to the library, four visits to the library would be great. So again, you just give out one set of sheets at a time rather than the whole thing and say, okay, bring it back when you're done with a thousand because you know those people out there. You know, 
who are going to finish it just like a lot of our families do with summer reading program. They start, you know, on a Monday and they're done on Tuesday because, you know, I mean, they're just, that's how they live their life. They've got to get that stuff done. Check. So, uh, or maybe you just want to have a very relaxed and easy introduction to the library. And again, that would be don't sweat that small stuff. So once you decide what you want to accomplish for your library, that helps you decide how you're going to form that program. What about the ages that you want to reach? Um, and there's lots of different ways to go about this. You can say birth to age five, if kindergarten is kind of your traditional age uh, beginning um, in, your, in your community, uh, ages one to five, birth through age four, because there's a lot of communities that have um, 4K kindergartens, ages one to four. So you can decide what, what works best for you. Um, I mentioned earlier that we started our program in lacrosse at age one because our focus group felt that, that that's when the little tots would enjoy it more. But on the other hand, it was hard for us as staff, you know, we were listening to what our, our focus group was saying, but we really felt like, you know, we're big believers in catch the kids in the cradle and that really it's important to read from your children at birth on. So what we did, and this is a little, little baby book bee logo we adapted, we created a baby book bees for kids birth through age one. So we did this after a year or so after we started our Thousand Books program. We added in a program just for birth through age one. You know, read 25 books to your baby and they'd have, or excuse me, uh, we had 25 level, 25 books per level sheet. Read 100 books to your baby before they turn one. And then the kids were automatically 100 books ahead when they started Thousand Books. If I were to start this program a third time, but I'm retired now so I won't, um, I definitely would start it at birth because it really makes it nice. What about incentives? Do you want to offer incentives? And do you want to offer incentives for kids and or parents? And there's various costs to these kinds of things that you might give out. And there's nothing to say you have to give them out. Again, Thousand Books is very flexible. So on the low cost um, end of things, stickers, just stampers, any kind of stampers and you stamp um, when the kids come in, you, you stamp their booklet or their folder or whatever you have or their sheet. Very low cost, very affordable, very sustainable. And I like to talk a lot about sustainability in terms of your budget because you can go big budget, but for a program like the one that we did in Menasha that's now entering its, I'm doing my math here, its seventh year, can you still afford after seven years, and because you're constantly getting new kids are born and come into the program, what you are setting up as your materials, can you afford to, and incentives, can you afford to do this over a multi-year time period? Um, so that really can inform your decisions. Um, kind of mid-cost, kind of in the middle, uh, paperback books, you can, there's a lot of sources of, of books that you can get, whether it's really kind of nice conditioned um, donations or um, some, there's some places you can get books, and we'll look at those in resources at the end. Um, mid-cost also a book bag, magnets, window clings, you know, if you decide to do something more for the parents. In terms of high cost, um, CDs, very high cost. It's, it's tough to find a, a, a place where you can get them in a way that you could give out 10 or 1 or 2 or 3. It's, those can be your high end. Um, finger puppets, we actually give away finger puppets in our lacrosse thousand books. And those finger puppets we got for dirt cheap. I mean, it was a, it was a, a you know, going on a business sale and we were able to pick up finger puppets for like, I think maybe a dollar each. It was just, it was an insane deal. Um, once those are gone, then like, you know, we're done with that because we'll never find that, I think, as good. What's nice about incentives is that some of these 
things like a, a book bag or a magnet or a bib if you wanted to have something a little more special for your very youngest children. You know, you can put your library logo and thousand books on there to kind of brand it, which is really, really nice. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, we've been skirting it, but I want to get a little bit more down deep into what is your budget going to be. First of all, your budget is going to be 100% dependent on the design that you that you go for. And one of the big things when you're setting up this program is thinking about how many kids are we going to have and how many will finish and how much do we need along the way. And I like to tell people um, to think about it in terms of your summer library program model, your summer reading program model. So you know, maybe you have a population in your community of um, 350 total kids out there in the community. And it just, it's pretty inevitable that you get 100 kids in your summer reading program. And out of that number of children, all 100 don't finish whatever it is that's your goal. Sometimes, you know, you're a miracle place. And then if that's your uh, situation, yay. But for most of us, along the way, children kind of drop out, you know, and they, they don't complete the program. So think about what your percentage of, of usage is or, or um, how many kids are participating throughout your summer reading program. So maybe you have 100 kids out of the whole 350 kids out there in your community, 100 get in your reading program, and maybe about 60 or 70 percent stay active. So that gives you some clues about how your thousand books is going to run because they are very parallel initiatives in how people respond. And maybe you have 20 to 30 percent who reach whatever goal has been set by you and the library. That is exactly how you have your response to your summer reading program and your participation will guide your decisions about how many people will be involved and what to plan for in terms of getting ready to launch it. Um, I've mentioned before considerations that you have to think about is how, as you're looking to cost it out, how sustainable is it? And I have here just a little peek at kind of some of the numbers when we did a spreadsheet for our lacrosse. We figured we were going to need a thousand folders because a thousand kids were what we expected. So that was going to be 20 cents a folder. The finger puppets were about a buck each. Um, the color dots were, they were inconsequential. We paid $30 for 10,000 and we have so many left I can't even say. I mean, it's just not an issue. We found books for about $2 a piece on average. For parents, the, la the lanyards were expensive. The window decals were not bad. Um, the magnets were a little bit high. And the book bags were kind of a, you know, that mid-level cost. So when we, when we planned it, and how many, you know, like already the lanyards, you'll notice that the, the books, we, we're saying about half the kids will finish. We probably were a little um, excited about that. That should have been more at 30%, so more like 300 books. But we got it down to about 7 bucks per child. Um, and when we took out some of those parent incentives, um, we now have it under $5 per child. So that's sustainable over the life of a program for us. Um, I think that in, in, when we did it in Menasha, because we did the three ring binders and the CDs, it was $14 a child. And it made me sweat to think, how could we keep this going? So just something to keep in mind as you're thinking about your budgets. And of course, how are you going to fund this? Well, you know, it really is a library program. So you may want to take it, you know, instead of one of your performers that you might get an outside performer, you may want to fund this, um, not have one performer during your year and use that money, that three or four hundred dollars um, or whatever the cost is, put that money into funding your thousand books. If you have a Friends of the Library, this is often something that they're very excited to fund or put money towards. There are small grants from some of the big big box stores like Target and Dollar General. 
If you have one of those stores in your county or near you, oftentimes you can write um, a, you know, a grant for this kind of stuff. Uh, Ezra Jack Keats, $500 grants is a possibility. There are ALS grants. Even, you know, your, look at your service groups. Rotary and JCs and Kiwanis were all very excited about this. They are, they are very supportive of early literacy. So we were able to get on all of our um, programs, and I, I believe that um, if you look back at Sandy's uh, program at Brementown, when she, or Bremen, Indiana, she had uh, service clubs who stepped up. Also memorials. If someone comes up and said, we'd like, you know, we'd like to give you money, it's great to have something like this ready to say, hey, would you like to um, you know, put your name with this, you know, put your loved one's name on the material. So, um, or, or a special fundraising appeal, you know, just sending, sending something out. I think that that's a really easy way, or getting a local business to support you. Um, it, it's really easy to come up with the money for an early literacy initiative like this. Uh, both times I've been involved with the program, we were able to raise a couple of thousand dollars, um, you know, surprisingly fast because people could see how this would benefit the children in the community. Now you probably will want to keep some kind of track of your participation. It's good to have these statistics to help you understand um, how much kids have been read reading and also you can use it for your publicity. <laughs> And you can make very simple, you can use hatch marks, you know, how many sheets have been returned, hatch mark, hatch mark. All those old catalog cards you might have laying around, you could also repurpose them if you just want to have a little physical um, place to, to keep track of your, um, who's participating. A simple, just a simple Excel sheet if you're a single library, you can just make an Excel sheet. Um, since we have three locations on the top of this slide, you see we have a, a, a database our IT guy made. And this is so we could have it open, but a, a Google spreadsheet can do the same kind of helpful um, keeping track. And what we would do on ours is we would actually, um, on all of these sheets, we would ask for the parent's email address as well as the child's uh, birth date. And that just kind of helped us. The birth date wasn't incredibly important, but the email was. And we're going to look in a few minutes at why that was an important piece. We also just, we did start dates just to kind of see how did parents do and, and what were we really looking at? You know, how much were people uh, coming right in? Were they spreading it out? And we would keep, you know, just like each level of our, both the, the Excel sheet or the database, we could easily compare um, how many people were in for 100, 200, 300. And the nice part about this, or, or a little bit more detailed kind of keeping track, is you also can help parents when they go, oh, you know, we haven't been here for a couple of months. We've, we've kind of fallen out of our routine. Well, where are we? And one of the things we wanted to do in our project goals in, in both of these programs was to make it easy on parents and families. So when we get this very inevitable, oh, you know, we don't know where we are, we go, oh, you have the 200 level sheet, I'm sure you finished it by now, here's the 300. So we wouldn't go, okay, see if you can find that sheet and bring it back in. You know, we just kept it very mellow. Oh, and I, I, I should mention, let me go back to that slide, there's also, there is a Thousand Books Before Kindergarten app, and that'll be in our resources, we'll just mention it, that parents can do their own, um, right on their mobile phones, they can keep track. So we'll look at that in a little bit. So, again, flexibility. What's your dream theme? What would you like to do for having your um, theme B for your Thousand Books program. Old MacDonald had a farm, or maybe under the sea, or maybe going into the rainforest or the jungle and finding animals. There's a picture here of uh, Itsy Bitsy Spider. And look at that. The water spout is a dryer. Yeah, it's a dryer tube. I love that. Um, a train. 
Um, the last one has, has gumball machines. I mean, you really can make this theme anything that you want. And that makes it very exciting when you're doing your planning because you can really play. You can make it be generic. Um, once you get going on the program, it's good to do ongoing promotion and marketing because, you know, you can launch it and have a kind of a woohoo, you know, like maybe you want to have a special concert or something to launch your program or, you know, you get some, some media support or support from your schools. Um, so what do you do to kind of keep the interest up? Some things that people have used, and we've done some of this stuff, having special programs for the participants. So um, maybe you want to do, like we found it very popular to do before we opened programs or after we closed. So we would reopen the library after we closed for 40 minutes and maybe we'd serve mac and cheese because it was the evening. So, you know, like on a Friday night. And mac and cheese and then we'd invite, we'd play some music softly and parents could just be with their preschoolers to read. Or we might have a costume character come before the library opened. So we like to do a few special things. Now, remember I said we harvested people's emails if they, if they will share with us. Um, and if they don't, that's okay. But if they do, we would email, we had a little email newsletter. And we would maybe send out once or twice a year, three times a year, hey, we have a special program. Oh, um, you know, there's been 250,000 books read, a quarter million books have been read so far. Uh, maybe some early literacy hints. So it just kind of reminds people that this is, is happening in their community. Certainly um, letting schools know, putting posters at daycares, um, involving daycares as, as part of your Thousand Books program because they're reading so much to kids and you want to encourage that. Um, going to service groups in your community and talking about this, talking to United Way about what you're doing, um, talking with your schools about how you're contributing to early literacy, talking to the Kiwanis and JCs so that people are aware in your community on what you're doing for preschoolers and their families. And then, of course, press releases um, to your media or to the schools or, you know, wherever you can. Like, um, you know, every time you would get, we would get a sheet, it meant a hundred books were read. So, when we would look at ongoing numbers and say, wow, you know, a thousand books, a thousand sheets have been returned, oh my gosh, that's a hundred thousand books that have been read. That's something you can really, you know, get um, the media or, or put posters or really get the word out there to your community about what's going on with preschoolers. So that's a way to keep the, uh, the program very vital. And then once they finish, what happens? Or you can have a graduation party, give them that forever book as we like to call it. Maybe take a snapshot of the children. Maybe let them start again. I mean, it's really up to you what you want to do because again, and that question mark there really says you can create with the flexibility of this program whatever meets the needs of your community. And I just want to spend a little bit of time going through these resources with you because these can really help you on your way towards creating programs and answer questions. And not to be self-serving, but I'm putting up a blog post that I did a couple years ago called um, Thousand Books Before Kindergarten is Still Rocking. It was kind of a here's what's been happening in the last few years. And it's got a ton of resource links to some of what we saw today, to um, research, to information. It's just really very rich in links that you can use. I mentioned to you um, early in our webinar the um, Thousand Books Before Kindergarten Google Map. So this is how to get to that map and to get a hold of Kathleen Larson and say, we're doing it or, you know, it's launched and she'll get you up on that map. Now a lot of times when you're planning this program, you're gung-ho, but maybe your manager or your board or your director is less gung-ho. 
or you're getting some questions, maybe even from your from staff around the library. Well, what you know, can, how important is this? In the next resource, Bryce Don't Play, in her blog, she has research links on the importance of reading to preschoolers that will give you, if you're writing a grant, if you're trying to convince your funders or people in your own institution about the importance, this blog post really will help you with the information you need. And then I've also included um, two blog posts, um, Library Program Mojo and Library Bonanza that answer questions about their approach to setting up a thousand books before kindergarten program. In terms of websites, Colorado has a very rich website on a thousand books before kindergarten. Beth Christ from the Colorado Department of Education has created a very excellent website and, and I love it because it actually has, <laughs> those kind of cool, uh, a great uh, webinar that has Sandy Cross talking about her process. So that is just wonderful. Just wonderful to hear her talk about her thoughts behind creating this program. Uh, Waukesha County Federated Library System actually has two links here that I want to talk about. The first is they also did a, a Thousand Books Before Kindergarten webinar where they went through a little bit more um, some other um, different programs to look at. So uh, that is also out there for you to, to kind of get ideas. The PDFs that I showed you of um, the different parts of our lacrosse um, materials that showed you the little seed bookmarks and the literacy bookmarks and so on that we used, our forms that we send out our 100 level sheets, those are downloadable and you can look at those more carefully at our uh, Winding Rivers Library System website. And if you want to look at uh, more information about the Thousand Books Before Kindergarten downloadable app, Waukesha also developed that with uh, UW-Milwaukee, so that's pretty good. Uh, there's a Pinterest board that's out there um, that I've developed that just anytime I see a program or people let me know, I pin it. And then, of course, there's the free startup guide to help you with a lot of these questions as well. Um, for books, you know, consider scholastic literacy partnerships, book outlets another one. Um, there's also the pre-made program materials that you can find and buy. So if you don't want to develop it all from, from start, there's lots of ways for you to find answers to your questions. Oh my gosh, you got to keep in touch. I mean, we're at the end and we kind of went through quickly, but um, there are any number of um, questions you may have, and of course we will have a little time today to answer some of them, but we'll also, anything that you, you get out there, we will answer and um, we'll put into your um, resources. So uh, if you do want to get in touch with me or follow my blog, um, feel free. I'd, I'd love to hear from people. Um, it's great to get a program like this started, and I can really say that the time it takes to create it is not that bad, and <laughs> once you create it, it is a wonderful early literacy support for your community. Question? Thank you so much, Marge, for that wonderful information. It looks like we have time for a couple questions from our listeners. Um, just a reminder that the full Q&A will be emailed to you next week if we don't get to your question today. Marge, our first question is, how can I integrate this program into my other early literacy initiatives? Um, you know, one thing, <clears throat> I think one thing that you can do is thinking about, you know, because some of your early literacy um, initiatives are your story times. So hopefully you take breaks sometimes in your story times, and that, you know, if you do have a two or three week or maybe a month long break a couple of times a year, it's a perfect time to start a planning these programs and getting them set up. But then in those story time breaks, because if, if your community is like our community, if, if, if we don't have story time, you know, like every minute of every day of every week of every month, uh, parents are like, oh, you know, oh, no, oh, we love you. And it's like, we love you too. Um, so having a program like this 
when you are in your story time breaks, it's a great time right before you have your final story time before a little break to say, hey, are you guys in Thousand Books before kindergarten? Because now you're going to do some fun stuff with reading while we're taking a break here for whatever reason. Um, and that's a great way to make those um, two things kind of be mirrors of each other. So very easy to do. Marge, kind of a related question. Um, do you count the books that, that um, children hear in story times towards their 1,000 book goal? Yes. Um, we always say to parents, you know, all you need to do is, you know, you can just say story time, you know, and little marks down to say there were three books. Um, that's a fine thing to do. And, and we also say if kids are listening to stories in, in daycare, you know, talk with your daycare provider and say, hey, how many stories did um, my child listen to today? The grandparents, you know, the babysitter, how many stories did you read? All of that counts. And it, it really kind of talks and supports that really literacy-rich environment for children. And do you have suggestions for books I can offer parents for the program? You know, I think that and, and I, I'm of two minds about this. Um, first of all, my first thought about, um, you know, should you make book lists or, you know, what kind of books do you offer parents? Your picture book collection is such a great resource, as well as some of your very easy nonfiction, you know, are really great resources to just open up people's eyes to all the different things so that they're not just reading, say, you know, the same books over and over. Um, you know, like maybe they're always just only taking out Berenstain Bears or only taking out the Disney princesses. So this is an opportunity to really kind of display and celebrate your collection. Sometimes people say, well, I, I feel like I should do a book list for parents. And, and one of the, the impacts of having a book list is that you have to be ready to buy or have available multiple copies of books. When you start a thousand books program, your pressure, the pressure on your picture book collection is going to be very high. People are going to come in and just start checking those babies out. So if you say, um, I think that you should, um, you know, here's, here's a list of say 50 books or a hundred books that would be great for you to read to your preschooler, you're going to find that those books are gone all the time. So you, you want to set up people for success. So you, that's where you might want to use like a prolific author, a Denise Fleming or, you know, Lowell Willems and say, try some of these authors. But, you know, I think that's really a, 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 a question and a piece that you really have to think about because you, you don't want to create this because it, it will be big. When you do a thousand books, you will be just delighted in the usage of your collection. And it's really an opportunity to have those books rock and roll out from your shelves. So you, you don't want to create an expectation that, well, why don't you ever have, you know, this book, you know, such and such a book. It's on your book list, but I have to put it on reserve and I have to wait for it. And, you know, you're recommending it. So I think you have to kind of balance that out as you kind of come up with your strategy for 1,000 books. Okay, thanks Marge. Um, we have time probably for one or two more questions. Um, how about, how does this program affect your summer reading program? You know, for most libraries it's a little different from how they run their summer reading program with kids and we run both simultaneously. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for our summer reading program we have um, little literacy tips to use with the kids um, and activities for them to do on a, a daily basis. Whereas Thousand Books is just kind of an ongoing reading. But they can use, you know, however you have it set up. If they get doubles, all is good. And we like to say, yeah, you preschoolers, you're rocking this world. You have a little summer reading program thing happening and you have Thousand Books. So you don't have to worry too much about it. And it's, it's again, you know, when you think about summer reading program, it's probably crazy at your library if it's like every other library in the universe. Um, but it's not necessarily that you're crazy 
administering the summer reading program and its materials or prizes or whatever. It's more like there's a lot of people in the room, they've got questions, you know, you're, you're helping with the computers, you're, you're suggesting books. So the actual thinking about that kind of administration piece of the program is, is fairly simple. And just to give you uh, an example, at our, our both of the libraries that I worked at that used Thousand Books, we just had we bought a, a kind of a small uh, file cabinet, just just little file drawers, and um, they were made out of plastic, and we we got them at Shopko for thirty six dollars, and we put the materials for Thousand Books in one, and we bought another one for summer reading. So so you know they're right there at our fingertips, and and they're kind of put away in a way that doesn't have stuff all over the place. And it was just kind of an easy way to keep track of it. But it's it's not too bad. Okay, Marge, I think we have time for one more question. Um, do you see a role for nonprofit literacy groups in this type of program? Hmm, I think so. I mean, I think that you can partner with anybody that you want. I mean, I think you know, one of the things that we're seeing more of is um, kind of outreach programs that happen in daycares, um, which can be for profit, of course. But um, you know, the 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 program is um, placed out, you know, kind of outreach at those sites in daycares. Well, I think the same thing can happen for, you know, perhaps it's going to be at a WIC site that people can pick up a folder and it just says on the folder finish the first hundred books, come on to the public library, or uh, a special um, at the Y, or, or, you know, wherever it is in your community that children and families gather. I mean, you know, at your places of worship. This has the potential, in my opinion, of, of and, and, you know, you may not want to have, you know, you don't have to have a folder or a three-ring binder. You can have just a trifold for each, for each, um, uh, level and so you have you know how much is you know what does it cost to print off even just you know through your copier you know a level sheet to, and put it at different places in your community and it gives you a chance to partner with those nonprofits to talk about early literacy and the things that they can do with you to promote that I just think that could be tremendous Okay, we're going to wrap things up now. We'd like to thank Marge for sharing her insights and ideas around how to start a successful 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten program in your library. We hope that everyone was able to take away a few new ideas to try. There was some great discussion, and we appreciate all of you sharing your time with us. You will be receiving a survey at the end of the webinar to let us know how we did. Please take a few moments to fill this out. We would love your feedback so that we can make these sessions even better in the future. Feel free to comment on other topics that you would like more information on or speakers that you would like to hear from so we can consider building some of those things into our future schedule. We have received great feedback from our previous webinars that has helped us to focus on the topics that you are most interested in. Recording of this webcast will be available on the Demco Ideas and Inspiration website by next week, ideas.demco.com, or the site can be accessed through the demco.com website. So if you miss something or just want to review, you can go back and refresh yourself on the presentation or share with your colleagues. Next week, you will be receiving an email that will include a copy of the presentation slides and a Q&A log that documents and answers the questions that came up today. Again, thank you for joining us today. Please consider joining us on November 18th at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, when Tracy Lesneski from the National Library Design Firm, MSR Architects, presents Library as Center for Innovation. Keep watching our Ideas and Inspiration site for other new webinars. You'll also find many that are available on demand to watch at your convenience. We hope that you will consider joining us for future events. Again, so glad you joined us and hope you have a wonderful afternoon.